welcome to The Reality Revolution. I am your host, Brian Scott. Today we're returning to U.S. Anderson. We're doing a different book than Three Magic Words, which we will return to on the next round. But there's a chapter from U.S. Anderson's beautiful book, Success Cybernetics, Practical Applications of Human Cybernetics, that is really good. I got a lot of information out of it. U.S. Anderson is super fascinating. He has written fiction books, and I've got a chance to get a couple, and they're really, really interesting. And he also wrote a book as his last book in 1977 on the secret of pyramids, and it is a first-person account of him going through different psychedelics and experiencing the power of pyramids, and it totally changed the way I viewed U.S. Anderson. He wrote a book following on the success of Psycho-Cybernetics by Maxwell Maltz, and harnessing that, wrote a really good book using cybernetics as a background. Cybernetics, as the way he defines it, is an automatic function of your nervous system. When you create goals and change habits, you can hit marks by using a cybernetic system. And he talks about using this cybernetics to create success and do a variety of other things. His discussion is spot on. He was a football player, so he comes from sort of a different background than a lot of these other authors. We begin with a chapter called How to Use the New Science of Success Cybernetics. Anderson begins by saying, when you set the thermostat on the wall of your room at 70 degrees and the temperature in the room falls below 70, your furnace comes on. That's cybernetics, the science of automatic control. It's given us the automatic pilot, the fire control mechanism, the guidance system in missiles, the automated assembly line, and the electronic computer. It puts a brain in machines, a brain that responds automatically to signals quickly and efficiently, performing hundreds of accurate calculations in a split second, and has taught us how to train the human brain and nervous system to the same kind of performance. How to preach sermons and win football games. Success cybernetics is automatic control that hits a selected target. If the automatic control misses the selected target, that's failure cybernetics. There was this preacher who never could remember the names in his sermon, so he'd pin them inside his coat and refer to them as he preached. One Sunday, he started out by saying, And the Lord created the first man, and his name was Adam. Then our Lord created the first woman, and her name was Eve. Then Adam and Eve had a son, and his name was Robert Hall. Oops. There are computers which occasionally function like that, only they never say oops. A guy with a bank balance of $2.98 gets a statement that shows he's got 298000 in the bank. But it's pretty tough to get that money out. Somebody is almost certain to wake up to the fact that the computer made a mistake and the machine is then fixed. But there are people who keep acting their whole lives as if Cain were Robert Hall or they've got 300000 on deposit when they've got only three. But now they can be fixed too, in just the same way as the computer is fixed with Success Cybernetics. Success Cybernetics synchronizes goals with the automatic responses which will achieve those goals. If you aim at a target and hit it, your goal and responses are synchronized and you're using success cybernetics. If you aim at a target and miss it, your goal and responses are unsynchronized and you're using failure cybernetics. Everybody uses one or the other. I've had experience with both. I remember my experience with failure cybernetics well. I played on a Stanford football team that lost eight straight games. Were our goals and responses synchronized? Judge for yourself. Just prior to the last game of the season, we were going back to New York City to play Dartmouth when one of the boys on the team came up to the coach and said, Coach, this is the last game of the season. After this, we can break training, can't we? The coach looked at him with big, sad eyes. What are you going to do now? He asked. Take dope? How to build towers and turn on the coffee. There are success responses and there are failure responses. And no athlete ever became a winner by doing his training in nightclubs. There was a sports writer on the San Francisco Chronicle who must have been a cybernetician himself. He wrote a column that was headed, Stanford Team Six Inches from Success. His subhead read, that six inches is between their ears. 
It's with the automatic responses that exist in the six-inch span between our ears that success cybernetics is concerned. A computer can be built so complex and sophisticated that it can guide a missile to Mars and take pictures after it gets there. But if they put the wrong responses into that computer, it couldn't turn on your coffee. The human brain is like that. No telling what it's capable of. Nobody's using more than a fraction of its potential. Don't take my word. They'll tell you that at every brain research laboratory in the country, but people train responses into the brain when they are five years old, like crying to get candy, then wind up frustrated and surprised when that response doesn't produce money when they're 30. That brain can make all the money its owner asks it to. It just has to be trained with success responses. It's like the computer that sent the missile to Mars, but which most people use to turn on the coffee. How many storage cells are there in the largest computer ever made? 40,000. How many storage cells in the human brain? 10 billion. 200,000 times the capacity of the largest computer ever built. That's the kind of fabulous machine you and I carry around between our ears. And Success Cybernetics is concerned with training the responses into it that will enable the use of its full capacity. The cat's now out of the bag. The brain builds towers as easily as it turns on the coffee. How you use it is up to you. How to typewrite and play the piano. You see, over at IBM or Rocketdyne or General Information Systems, when they want a computer to perform a certain job, a group of people sit around the room and design the attitudes and habits that will enable the computer to accomplish its goal. These people are called programmers, and the attitudes and habits they design are called a program. They install the program in the memory of the computer, and when they press a button, they get a success response. If they don't get a success response, they don't throw away the computer or say it's stupid or haven't any talent or is a natural born loser. No, indeed. They know there's nothing wrong with the machine except its attitudes and beliefs. And they simply pull them out of the computer and redesign them until they get a success response. In short, the machine functions only as well as its habits and attitudes and now Success Cybernetics has proven that people are just the same way. For example, when you first learn how to typewrite, you have to think which finger hits which key, and your typing is slow and full of mistakes. If you accept that as your standard, and adopt the attitude that you're a bad typist, you set that program into your nervous system and remain a bad typist as long as that program operates. But if you set up an attitude to become a good typist that programs your nervous system so that your subsequent typing trains you into success habits. Then a day arrives when you can look at a sentence on a piece of paper or think of a sentence in your mind and your fingers automatically transcribe that sentence onto the paper in the typewriter, responding to signals accurately and efficiently like the thermostat on the wall the guidance system in a missile or the program in a computer. The same thing happens when we learn how to play a piano, drive an automobile, fly an airplane, drive a golf ball. We set attitudes and habits into the nervous system and they determine the success of our efforts. Maybe it takes some of the frosting of the heavenly cake to regard the human body as a complex machine. But the moment we begin to realize it is, we are well on the way to getting its best performance. Mystics will still argue for a little man in the skull, and there he may dwell, for all anyone knows, but his hand isn't on the helm. There's an automatic pilot, and the best he can do is to see that pilot is properly programmed to reach its goal. The brain and the nervous system comprise a computer-like machine and must be treated as such to achieve successful performance. How to play chess with a learning machine. You say a machine can't learn. Are you in for a surprise? It started in the laboratories of IBM. One day a bunch of computer scientists were talking about what computers could do, and one smart aleck chirped, wouldn't it be something if we could teach this machine to learn? That was the knee slapper. When they stopped holding their stomach and started drying their eyes, the smart aleck continued, wait a minute, what causes learning? 
It's just an attitude, isn't it? And can't we set an attitude into a computer? All we have to do is design a circuit that says periodically I'm going to go over the things I've done and throw out the things that didn't work and keep the things that did work and try some things that look like they might work. Now, that shouldn't be so hard to do. In an instant, the big joke became theory, and they set to work to build a learning machine. When it was finished, they stored in its memory the standard moves of a game of chess. Then they called in 10 chess players. Two of them were rank amateurs, two highly skilled professionals, the rest scaled between. They were told, boys play the machine. The boys played the machine, they all beat the machine. When they were told play it again and again, and the third time around, the computer beat the two amateurs, and the 30th time around, it had beaten everybody but the two professionals. And here was a machine designed to learn and to keep on learning and to constantly improve its skills and its abilities. Who can say as much for people? It's no great secret that IBM keeps this computer under wraps. It would throw so many vice presidents out of work that we'd be up to our hips in private washroom keys. Is there any chance between a machine that keeps learning and one that has already decided to stop? IBM ran a few learning machines off the assembly line. The first one scared hell out of them. They decided to ask it a question to which nobody knew the answer. They asked it, is there a God? And the little slip of paper came out and said, there is now. Don't panic, that's apocryphal. How to do it yourself. Sometimes in an instant. Mainly the learning machine woke up the psychologists who had been slumbering peacefully for years, but since the machine had no id or childhood traumas and would not lie on a couch and free associate, they were at a loss as how to deal with it. Nevertheless, something had to be done. The machine could replace people, and they were people themselves, so they took their hats in their hands and humbly consulted the computer scientists as to whether the learning technique could be applied to humans. Sure, they were told, it's only an attitude. What of the great god Freud and his mysteries? What of the labyrinthian depths of the subconscious mind? It was nonsense to think that something so simple could work with the complex Freudian mind. A dignified exit was in progress when a computer scientist remarked gently, you fellows ought to have the machine's attitude. It throws out the things that don't work and tries the things that look like they might work. A couple of guys at the rear overheard that remark. It started them thinking. They decided to do something about it and the cybernetics of the mind was born. Over at Columbia University, they took a bunch of bad spellers and put them in a class and told them they were good spellers. Everybody began to spell better. They took a bunch of kids who couldn't do math and told them they were good at it. Everybody improved at math. They took some people who were lousy public speakers and told them they were good speakers. No more lousy speakers. Amazing. A person's attitude determined what he could learn, just like the machine. But nobody believed it except the people who saw it. Why should they? Everybody is addicted to his own pet complexity. If you don't believe that, have an attorney drop some papers saying, that cat caught the rat. You'll get 15 pages, which nobody understands. So the Freudians continued to pour out their jargon, id, ego, superego, ad infinitum. The kid who was a bad speller had suffered a trauma when he misspelled a word and the class all laughed. The cyberneticians were only curing the trauma with support psychotherapy and without a license to practice to boot. Let them try out their nonsense on some psychotics, then they'd see. The cyberneticians obliged. They went to an institution and told a few inmates, you're sane. The inmates became sane. 10,000 tomes on psychology become obsolete overnight. And a grinding of teeth sounded in scent-laden offices from Los Angeles to New York. No sense probing the past when the issue was clear. Attitude determines human performance. If the performance is poor, just change the attitude. That doesn't make five years at $25 a week. You can do it yourself, sometimes in an instant. How to get black eyes and become a bad salesman. The only thing difficult is that attitude becomes habits. And the only problem with changing them is that we use them to think. 
that's the trouble with us humans. We think that we're thinking when we're making elaborate rationalizations to justify our responses, which are often bizarre and produce continual defeat. Here's a kid five years old who goes out in the street and gets in a fist fight and comes up with a black eye and runs home crying. Next week, another fight, another black eye. The week after that, he comes up with a bloody nose. It gradually dawns on him that it might be a good idea to stay off the street. So he stays away from the other kids. He keeps his mouth shut if they talk to him. He sits in the corner at parties, no black eyes. The attitude works fine, and so he keeps on using it day after day, month after month, year after year, just like learning how to typewrite, just like learning how to play a piano, just like learning how to drive a car. He builds a habit into his nervous system an automatic response. When this kid gets to be 30 years old and he takes a job as a salesman, the first day out, he raises his hand to knock on a door and suddenly feels sick to his stomach. It must be the flu. He rationalizes and goes home to sleep it off. Next day, he doesn't make it out of the car because reading in the paper that there's a financial recession, he rationalizes, what's the use in calling on anybody? They won't have any money. That gives him time to examine his product carefully and he rationalizes a lot of flaws in it. So eventually he doesn't leave the house at all. Why should he? Nobody would buy the product anyway. And all the time he believes that he's thinking. Eventually, his sales manager calls him in and asks him how he expects to sell anything. When he never sees anybody and this kid grown to 30 but still using attitudes and responses that kept him from getting a black eye when he was five recites a tale of woe and hardship likely to bring tears to anyone's eyes but a sales manager's perfectly logical perfectly reasonable seemingly factual and completely hogwash it is the same kind of logical garbage that drowns us with words in newspapers books and magazines and gives people the illusion that they are thinking when they're only reacting and often most poorly. Just the cat chased the rat, blown up into 15 pages of logical obscurity. Reason is a smokescreen. People don't think. They react. And they react the way they've been trained to react. And when they react poorly, they explain it with reasons, ipso facto, We get the ego and the id and the Oedipus complex and the power drives and deprivation complexes and penis envy, which makes mighty fine fiction if you're allergic to fact. How to dance around a campfire without bringing rain. People are what their experience has conditioned them to be. If experience has conditioned them to failure responses, they must be reconditioned to success responses in order to achieve goals. This is not done by investigating the past. Who cares what caused it? What changes it is what matters, and changing it is done in the present. Let's face it, short of physical disability, which is the province of physical medicine, the only reason people wind up on the psychiatrist's couch or in a mental institution is because they're trying to reach goals with failure responses. That produces frustration. Frustration unglues the brain and nervous system. It can be laid to the will of God or the Oedipus complex or astrology or just plain bad luck, but that doesn't cure it. The only thing that cures it is success responses, and success responses can be trained into the brain and nervous system in the very same way that failure's responses were trained into it. Pavlov proved it. It's being done every day with rats, dogs, horses, and people. Why is it ignored? For my money, it's for the same reason that an Indian dances around the fire to bring rain. No self-respecting rat would continue such efforts in the face of centuries of frustration. He has no imagination. That the Indian kids himself is clear to most people. What isn't clear to most people is they too kid themselves any time they justify continuing a habit that produces failure. Either they become frustrated or if they rationalize the failure, deluded. In either case, they're not functional, just complex machines programmed for failure. Yet today, anyone can change failure habits to success habits. That is success cybernetics. The nervous system is a habit robot. It makes automatic responses to signals the same way as the thermostat on your wall. 
If it doesn't turn on the furnace, it needs better habits. How to talk to a brain. Cyberneticians are tenacious guys. When they found out you couldn't always make a good speller out of bad speller by telling him he was a good speller, they looked into the matter further, making continual comparisons between the nervous system and the functioning of a computer. The problem was how to get success experience into the nervous system when failure experiences had become a habit. A guy with a nervous system trained to failure was on a treadmill. He continued to produce more failure experiences and ingrained his failure habits even further. If he was young enough, you might get him to change his habits by telling him he was different. But for most people, habits were so deeply ingrained they couldn't be changed by words or willpower. The only thing that could change them was a new experience. It was the old ploy about leading a horse to water but not being able to make him drink. Then somebody got to thinking about machine language and the fact that it was only electricity. At the input terminals of the computer, words and numbers are converted to electric current, which circulates through the machine, is modified by the attitudes and responses of the machine that is delivered to the output terminal, where it once again is converted into words or numbers. Hey, he cried. That's the same way the nervous system works. At the input terminals of the senses, sights and sounds are converted into electrical current. Electrical current circulates through the nervous system and is modified by attitudes and responses, then is delivered to the output terminals of the lips, tongue, voice box, hands, fingers, and feet, where it is converted into action. This was interesting enough for sure. How to read a new kind of stock market graph. Then the cyberneticians got real cute. They decided to investigate what went on in the brain when it was having an experience. They got some people together, attached electrodes to their heads, led the electrodes to an encephalograph machine so they could record the brain waves, then had a lot of odd events transpire in the room. A woman screamed. Somebody fired a gun. A dog ran across the room. Then everyone clustered around the brainwave graphs to see how the brain had reacted. What they saw looked like a stock market graph. I've got an idea, someone hollered. What we're looking at on that paper was caused by a portion of the brain was tickled by electricity, right? Light from a dog was converted to electricity at the retina, passed over the optic nerve, and tickled a tiny portion of the brain, and the person saw a dog. The dog was in his head, even though it was caused by a dog outside his head. True. Now, what would happen if that person imagined a dog? Everyone began talking at once, but the upshot was that nobody could account for the imagined dog on any other basis than that same tiny portion of the brain was tickled by the same kind of electricity, presto. They whipped blindfolds over the eyes of the people who had electrodes on their heads and asked them to imagine a gunshot, a woman's scream, and a dog running across the room. They then recorded the brain waves of the imagined experience and compared it to the brain waves of the real experience. The two brain waves were absolutely identical. They sat down weekly and considered this revolutionary fact. The nervous system didn't know the difference between a real and imagined experience. Therefore, it followed that imaginary experience was just as much a conditioner of attitudes, responses, and habits as a real experience. Therefore, it appeared that a person could condition himself to success, responses, by using his imagination to create success experience. How to shoot golf, play chess, and make basketball shots. They put this theory to test at the University of Chicago. They called in students from the undergraduate school, divided them into three groups, had them throw basketballs at a basket then scored their ability to make goals. Then they took the first group and told them, we want you kids to come out to the gym for one hour a day and practice throwing the basketball through the basket. They took the second group and told them, we want you kids to forget about basketball, don't touch a basketball, don't even think about it. They took the third group and told them, we want you kids to sit by yourselves for one hour each day and imagine yourself successfully throwing the basketball through the basket. At the end of 30 days, they gave three groups another test. The kids who had actually practiced one hour a day showed an increase in performance of 
The kids who hadn't practiced at all showed an increase in performance, and the kids who had practiced one hour a day only in their imagination showed an increase in performance of 23%. There it was. The nervous system didn't know the difference between real experience and imagined experience. Successful performance in the imagination could create success habits. Here is a conversation with Johnny Wooden, head coach of the national champion UCLA basketball team. Question, Johnny, do you ever have your boys mentally rehearse their shots? Answer, it's my first rule. Unless a kid can clearly visualize the basketball going through the basket, there is no chance he can throw it in when he has to. Arthur Schnabel rehearsed piano playing in his head. Capablanca rehearsed chess playing in his head. Ben Hogan rehearsed golf shots in his head. Every successful artist, athlete, businessman, salesman, whether he's aware of it or not, constantly rehearses successful performances in his head. That's what builds into him the habitual attitudes and responses that cause him to perform successfully in actual situations. And every failure, whether he's aware of it or not, is constantly rehearsing failure performance in his head. That's what builds into him the habit, attitudes, and responses that cause him to perform unsuccessfully in actual situations. And I'm not talking about positive thinking. All the positive thinking in the world won't make the basketball go through the hoop if you throw it out of the window. I'm talking about conditioning success responses into the brain and nervous system through mental rehearsal. How to use some stuff you don't really need. The story is told of a positive thinker who fell out of a 15th story window. Every time he passed a floor, people on that floor could hear him say, so far so good. Same as the Indian dancing around the campfire to bring rain, right? Maybe it keeps him stupidly happy, but he's in for a surprise. It won't rain and the ground is moving up fast. The trouble with positive thinking is that most people think it's magic. They think you can move the world with thought. They sit in their rooms and try getting things done by being optimistic. So what happens? Nothing. Just the Indian endlessly dancing around the campfire. The only thing positive thinking can move is you. And the way it moves you is the way it conditions your responses. If you think you're going to move the world by being optimistic, you naturally do nothing. You don't even throw the basketball out the window. You let it sit on the floor and try to wish it through the net. The guy in the institution who thinks he's Napoleon is a positive thinker for sure. The only difference between him and the Indian is that he's in and the Indian is out. In view of their results, both are somewhat over-optimistic, proving that attitude is not everything. Right action and realistic goals are just as important. Since the Indian and the pseudo-Napoleon have neither their attitudes produce only illusion. Goals, attitudes, and actions can be called a man's motivation. Some people have trouble with that word. I remember coming back to Detroit with the Detroit Lions after we'd won a surprise victory over the Chicago Bears and walking into the old Saverin Hotel to be greeted by the old janitor who was all smiles. You win, he exulted. How did you do it? I answered because we had motivation. That old man scratched his head and looked puzzled. Motivation, he asked. What position does he play? You can be assured it's an important position, but psychologists persist in looking for motives in motivation rather than regarding it as a sum total of man's habits. They tell us some people are motivated by love. I once heard of a man who wanted to learn a little something about love. He bought a big book called How to Hug. He didn't learn much. It turned out to be volume six of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Some good signal response might have saved him a few bucks. What differences does it make why people do things? They do them out of habit. That's all we have to know. And the habits are either success habits or failure habits. And if they're failure habits, they can be changed to success habits by creating success experiences in the mind. How to make a big score fast. A number of years ago, I ran my first seminar. 30 salesmen and five sales managers were in the group. They were being told about success habits and failure habits. And during 
a coffee break, one of the sales managers came up to me chuckling. You know, he said, I've got a guy working for me that is a living example of what you've been talking about, though. I never understood him before. When he came to work for me, I thought I'd found a gem. He was personable, intelligent, well-educated, and fine-looking. I trained him for three months and gave him the best territory in the company. He should have made 30000 a year. He worked there a year and made 7000 The head office threw a fit and told me to fire him. I just couldn't bring myself to do it, so I gave him the worst territory in the company. I figured he'd quit and I'd be saved in the embarrassment of firing him. He worked in that bad territory. He made 7000 Boy, I thought this guy's really caught fire. I brought him back in and gave him the best territory. He worked there a year. You know what? He made 7,000. Here was a guy whose nervous system obviously was conditioned to an income of $7,000 a year. When that sum was reached, rationalization set in. He was like a powerful car capable of going 150 miles per hour, but he was running around with a governor on his engine that kept him from going over 30. Failure habits make many forms, and one of the most pernicious is putting a low ceiling on performance. Those early training programs were fun because we pulled off a miracle. We got excited. Later, it became a matter of fact. The guy who never made more than $7,000 a year is now making more than $30,000 a year because his sales manager put him through success cybernetics and conditioned his nervous system for achievement. And that sales manager doesn't harangue his salesman or scare them or beguile them with prizes. He trains them in success habits and he runs the top division in the country. How to play music you'd like to perform to. So how does success cybernetics train people to achieve success? First, it has them set goals. Then it has them list the actions that will achieve these goals. Then it has them list the attitudes that will allow them to take those actions. Actions are a guidance mechanism, attitudes a power mechanism together they make a success mechanism just as is programmed into a missile or the memory unit of a computer cybernetics success training installs the success mechanism into the nervous system by practicing it until it becomes a habit first the success mechanism is carried about on a card and the person consciously performs the actions and adopts the attitudes each day second he rehearses the actions in his mind until he can clearly visualize them Third, he rehearses the attitude in his mind until he can clearly feel them. Fourth, he repeats the elements of his success mechanism to himself at night before falling asleep, thus giving each of the elements the suggestive power of auto-hypnosis. And fifth, and most important of all, he creates only success experiences in his mind. Simple, isn't it? Conditioning is always simple. Pavlov conditioned his dogs to salivate when a bell was rung. No food was present, but they salivated anyway. Automatic response is the hallmark of the nervous system, and it can be trained any way we choose. Why do I say the most important element of cybernetic success training is to play only success experiences in your mind? Because if you allow failure experiences to transpire in your mind, it conditions your nervous system for failure. Sometimes I have people imagine they've got two record cabinets in their heads. One group of records carries success experiences. The other group carries failure experiences. If they find themselves playing failure experiences on the imagination's turntable, they simply switch records. The nervous system responds according to what it has experienced. How to hold on to your head. Pause to reflect on the number of people who are trying to get themselves back on the beam by reviewing failure experience. This is called psychoanalysis. They go over and over the same failure experiences, defeat, guilt, sadness, loneliness, ad nauseum. So what happens? They condition their nervous systems for more failure. If finally they can be talked into accepting their failure, they are discharged as cured. That's like curing a broken leg by cutting it off. Not that it isn't sometimes tried. They'd amputate our head if the cyberneticians would let them. That's a sure way to eliminate worry. So how do you use success cybernetics? First, you make up your mind that you can condition yourself into any attitude, response, or habit you desire. Don't worry about that. You'll be firmly convinced by the time you finish this. 
Secondly, you create for yourself a personal success mechanism consisting of the goals you want to achieve and the attitude habits and the action habits that will achieve them. Effective attitudes are derived from an expansive self-concept. An expansive self-concept attacks. A limiting self-concept retreats. We'll go into details about this in later chapters. Finally, you train the success mechanism into your nervous system by daily practice, both mentally and physically. Meantime, remember those four mental conditioning laws. One, you are what you concentrate on. Two, what you concentrate on seems real. Three, what you concentrate on grows. Four, you always find what you concentrate on. In these four laws lie the power of cybernetics to condition the nervous system to success. This is such a beautifully written chapter, almost better than Maxwell Maltz's discussion of cybernetics. That's why I felt it was really important to discuss. If you're one of those doubting Thomases about Neville Goddard, for instance, I get it. The reason the teachings he has work are scientific. They don't have to be spiritual. Imagination is a very powerful way of programming your nervous system. At night, if you are regularly imagining with feeling in a first person's perspective, in the present moment of something that you want to achieve, accomplish, experience, then you are placing that into your nervous system. And this is incredibly powerful. You start to program your nervous system over and over with these success thoughts. When you imagine that you're living in your new house, it's just like shooting that basketball. And eventually it programs your habits. You start thinking and start doing things along the lines to achieve your goal. It is a cybernetic success mechanism. By concentrating on the success, you're programming it. So you don't have to believe. It's so powerful. You can be a complete atheist and just believe in the power of your nervous system. And you can understand that what you've experienced so far is the way that you've habitually acted within your nervous system. One of the great things about the teachings of Dr. Joe Dispenza is he is intricately linking the nervous system with the mind and that little place between in how we change our nervous system is what we're trying to accomplish. I want you to transform your life. I want you to have everything that you want and you can have it. And there are lots of things that go with that. The way you judge yourself, the morality of it, the spirituality of it. But if you want to just simply ignore that stuff, which naturally comes up and just go to the very basics of it, understand that your body is a computer. It's a success mechanism waiting to be successful. And if something doesn't work for you, then that means that you just change it and you learn. And you learn by adapting and changing and failures lead to success. And when you use these techniques of imagining visually what your success will be, it programs your body into a particular habit ritual. And then you'll do like you do when you type, when you learn how to type. Eventually you just do it. You don't think about pushing the keys. It's just a natural thing. Your success becomes this natural thing where you stop thinking about the success and it comes naturally because you have programmed your nervous system to that state. It's really an amazing realization. So for those of you that don't believe in the spirituality of this, it's still powerful. It's still something that you need to understand. Imagining with your feelings is key because you can graft it onto your neurology and your nervous system. We will definitely return to this book as well as Three Magic Words. Obviously, I'm a huge U.S. Anderson fan, and I am contemplating reading the entire Pyramid book all in one sitting. It's a long one, but it's so amazing. Maybe I'll do that. In any case, you can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution. Revolution.